at the end of the talk, the last talk was fantastic to see a quote from Richard Feynman. We're going to see a lot from Richard Feynman in this talk. And I must admit, it's um, daunting for me not only to close this conference, to be the final talk in this conference, but I'm a physicist. Um, my knowledge of biochemical pathways is approximately that. Um, so it's been a very intriguing um, conference for me, or at least I've been here today and I've, I've learned a lot. Um, so bear with me. I want to just ask a couple of questions. How many of you are familiar with the name Eric Drexler? Show of hands. Okay. How many of you have read the Burke Nanosystems? Okay. Right. So, in a nutshell, Eric Drexler is um, by, uh, quoted by many to be one of the, the forefathers of the idea of nanotechnology. The idea that we can take the individual atoms of matter, the individual molecules, break them down, and build them up into some other form. So, in a nutshell, the argument is that in a few decades' time, and very many in the scientific community do not hold to this particular ideal, but the idea is that you'll have something that looks like a microwave, you'll have um, countless billions of nanobots, nano assemblers, or nano factory inside that, that thing that looks like a microwave. You can dial in very many different programs. You go outside, you pick up some grass, you put it in this thing that looks like a microwave, 30 seconds elapses, ding, and out pops a steak. Because the only difference between the grass and the steak is how you arrange the individual atoms and molecules. What I want to do is to try and tease that idea out and just try and focus on really how feasible is that type of approach to actually scaling down on Drexel's idea whereby we scale down macroscopic technology, we scale down gears, cogs, engines, wheels, etc., down to the atomic level, down to the molecular level. How feasible is that? And how, ultra, how close are we ultimately to, to, to moving towards this idea of a nanofactory? So, nanotechnology, Drexler and diamondoid. So Drexler's, much of Drexler, or at least half of Drexler's classic text, which is nanosystems, where he outlines very many of his ideas, um, focuses on diamondoid and the pure carbon systems, the manipulation of atoms within those systems to build up different structures. And that is based around something called mechanosynthesis, pure force-driven um, chemistry at the atomic level. Now Drexler has received quite a lot of um, negative press, let's put it that way, from the scientific community um, at large re in relation to his ideas about nanofactories, nanosamples, etc. But it's important to give the guy kudos. Over 20 years ago, he had the, the vision that we would be able to do chemistry on the atom by atom level using mechanical forces. That is now it's certainly not routine in uh, physics laboratories, uh, physical chemistry laboratories, but certainly there are a number of groups doing that, just that at this moment. And I want to try and put across really what is the state of the art in terms of atomic manip manipulation. Before moving on to the idea of, well, can we think of a universal assembler? Can we think of a nanobot that can take any particular material and effectively convert it into any other material? Can we do nano alchemy, as it were? And the key thing, which was, I, I really, I mentioned during, at the end of one of the last talks when I asked the question that I was a surface physicist. So Wolfgang Pauli said that the surface was invented by the devil. This is the crux of the matter. This is the real crux, that surface chemistry, surface physics is so tricky, is so difficult. And the idea, the, the, the take home message, well, I'm afraid it's not a very positive message, but the take home message is that a universal assembler, or the idea of being able to convert one material or any material into another material at will, is simply entirely flawed. That's not to say that there aren't parts of Drexler's vision that are important, and it's, um, he's really been an incredibly um, important figure in terms of nanotechnology and bringing nanotechnology to the public consciousness, but there are flaws there. We can debate this. Um, and then it's a question of towards where, well, if there are so many flaws in this, what can we do? So I'm going to quote Feynman a number of times. Feynman had this wonderful one-sentence definition of science, which was science is the belief in the ignorance of experts, which we're not going to the details of what he said, that, but I thought that was a wonderful phrase. So what I've done is I've pulled a, a as you can see, a quote from actually a first-year engineering student 
Um, instead of the, the, the usual quotes from talking heads, focus on what we were capable of doing when limited to manipulating at the smallest millimetres and think about nanotech again. Hell, even with the little education I have at this stage, I can see its possibilities as the next discovery of time. So perhaps a little hyperbolic, but the idea that you can take matter and manipulate it into uh, atom by atom or molecule by molecule into specific structures using tips, using probes, is extremely important and drives nanometer scale science, drives nanotechnology, has driven this huge blur that has arisen about nanotechnology and huge excitement that has arisen, uh, arisen about nanotechnology over the last 10 years or so. Feynman again. Back in 1959, which is, this is a very prescient, very um, interesting quote from Feynman. It's interesting to put the quote that was, came up at the, la the, the end of the last talk in the context of this quote. But I'm not afraid to consider the final question as to whether, ultimately, in the great future, we can arrange the atoms the way we want, the very atoms all the way down. He wasn't to know that 30 years after he said this, this was back in 1959, he wasn't to know at the time that he said this, that, in fact, an instrument called the scanning tunneling microscope, and I'm not going to go into the details of the quantum mechanics of that, what we have is a microscope that is like no other. We don't have lenses. What we have is a sharp tip. We try and make that tip atomically sharp, which can be a challenge in itself, and you bring it in close to a surface. So not that you're touching, but close enough so that you get electrons which can tunnel across that gap. Even though there's no effective electrical connection there, electrons can do some wonderful, nice quantum mechanics and tunnel across that gap. And then you move it back and forth across the surface, and you measure that tunnel current. And from that tunnel current, you can build up a picture of the surface at the atomic scale. But it's even better than that, because you can operate it in two modes. You can operate it where the tip is up here, where you try not to perturb the, the surface, you try not to move things on the surface, or you can operate it in a mode whereby you move the tip towards the surface and move it back and forth so that you deliberately interact with something, so that you move things around. You might be wondering, well, how the heck does this sort of tie into the general themes of SENS? So I got the email from Aubrey a few months ago, who said, would you like to speak, in, inviting me to speak at this conference? And I sent him an email back, and, well, you know, that's fine, but I have absolutely no background in sort of anti-aging research. I have no background in biochemistry. Are you sure you want me to do this? Um, he said, yes. I sent him another mail, or you, or email, are you absolutely sure? He said, yes. So, <laughs> blame Aubrey. So, this, for me, is one of the iconic images of 20th century science. It is just staggering. So what they've done here is they've taken, this is the IBM group, um, a guy called Don Igler and his team, have taken 50 ion atoms on a copper surface and they've formed this ring. That in itself is, is, is a feat of atomic scale engineering. For a physicist, what the really good bit is what you can see in the centre is you can actually see standing waves. You can see the, the wave-like nature of the, of the electrons within this corral. But the key thing here is that we are now at the point where we can take individual atoms on certain well-chosen surfaces under certain very well-chosen conditions and build up atomic scale structures. This was formed at 4 degrees above absolute zero, liquid helium temperature, in a pressure 13 orders of magnitude smaller than the pressure in this room, so comparable to that you get in deep space. If you warm this thing up by 10 degrees, 20 degrees K, it falls apart because thermal diffusion kicks in. However, it's also possible to, 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 to take atoms and also to actually form bonds. This is work by Wilson Hole's group where they've actually taken iron and carbon monoxide molecules and by injecting electrons from that tip formed iron um, carbon monoxide complexes. And you can see the level of complexity, the type of patterns that we can form. But, I stress this again, on very well-chosen systems under very well-chosen conditions. Let's contrast that. So this is Eric Drexler speaking in Engines of Creation, back in 86. Assemblers will be able to make virtually anything from common materials without labour, replacing smoking factories with systems as clean as forest. It's a long way from, we're, we're a very, very long way from that particular idea. But this is... This is the interesting thing, and this is the thing that I guess has frustrated so many of us who work at the coal face, who actually do these experiments, and have to, on a day-to-day -day basis, suffer the frustrations of, well, I spend 12 hours moving atoms around into a particular pattern, and then the last atom I want to just click into place decides to absorb itself on the tip. Bang goes, you know, a day's work. Time and time again, that type of thing happens. But there have been these remarkable predictions, like drop off, you know, in very 
um, important and popular journals, not just in terms of um, popular science journals, but a range of other um, uh, professional journals. Those researchers most familiar with the field of molecular nanotechnology see the technology base underpinning